the rest of the story. It was not Al's fault, really. It was just as though he were born that way. Just plain unable to handle money. Remember that, unable to handle money. His wife Betsy kept their books. She had to. Minus her constant attempts to rectify the family finances, Al would always have been in debt. It was as though he were an aggressive gambler or a reckless investment speculator. He was neither. Al was simply totally, unbelievably befuddled by the household budget. He deeply empathized with people who borrowed more than they could pay. He often sought to help them in their crises. The problem was that Al was himself always borrowing more than he could pay and so could rarely afford to assist. Fortunately, Al was never imprisoned for indebtedness, as so many were who lived in that day. And this thanks to wife Betsy, who stretched the family income to astonishing limits, who saw to it that the bills were paid when they could be or plausibly postponed when they could not be, but... This is the rest of the story. Onto this burdened beast of financial woe was laid what threatened to be the final straw, blackmail. It began, ironically enough, with a pretty young girl beseeching Al for a loan. Her name was Maria Reynolds. She claimed to have been abandoned by an abusing husband. All she needed, she said, was sufficient cash to return to her family in New York. As usual, Al was in no financial position to help, but equally characteristically, he tried to do it. He tried to scrape together something. He assured Maria that he would do what he could, but would require an address in town to which he might send the money. The cash for Maria's return home was hand-delivered to her apartment by Al personally, and that's, well, that's when the affair began. And it was Maria's husband who eventually returned to blackmail Al, claiming to be the injured party. The man negotiated over a sum that might relieve his misery. The amount agreed upon was a thousand dollars, which Al produced with extraordinary difficulty. And of course, it would not be the last of this dishonored husband's monetary demands. Still, all things considered, the greatest damage in this disaster was not to Al's marriage, but once again to the household budget. The blackmail's initial lump sum and subsequent smaller payoffs put new and amazing stresses on wife Betsy's bookkeeping ingenuity. Al was once heard to have said that he was only worth about $500 in the whole world, but he should have been so lucky. Because by then, as almost always, he had no money at all. In fact, he owed thousands of dollars more than he was worth. And he died as he had lived. In the end, he was shot and killed in a duel, ironically, by a man he had accused of being, among other things, unable to manage money. By the way, it was Al, whose every action seemed to undermine his family's finances. It was the same Alex who had taken the non-existent credit of the United States government to a world-class, unsurpassed pinnacle. It was he who, on our nation's behalf, had manipulated millions of dollars with dramatic dexterity and with phenomenal success. For Alexander, this man who could not handle his own money at all, was President George Washington's very first Secretary of the Treasury, Alexander Hamilton. Now you know the rest of the story.